I am Katherine Strobel, and this is our Leadership Speaker Series. This is a program that we hope will serve as inspiration, which I all think we can use right now, um, by learning about different professionals, stories, habits, and behaviors that contribute to their successful leadership. Today with us, we have Dr. Michael D. Anthony. Dr. Anthony is the Vice President of Student Affairs and Institutional Effectiveness at Prairie State College in Chicago Heights, Illinois. He is a pre peer review volunteer with the Higher Learning Commissions Corporation. He is the founder of his consulting organization where he provides leadership and diversity solutions to various organizations. For over 14 years, he conducted leadership trainings for student governments um, at regional and national conferences. He served as chief diversity officer and assistant VP for student affairs at Oakton Community College. And he also worked at the University of Louisville in multiple roles, including a residence director, a coordinator in the Office of Civic Engagement and the director of the Cultural Center. Dr. Anthony, welcome. Thank you so much. It's so, so nice to be joining you today. It's so great to have you. I'm really excited about this interview. I always knew that um, you've done a lot of amazing things, but after doing more research, I was even more impressed. So oh. I'm excited to delve into um, the first question. Sure. And I'd like to begin with opening up, if you can just share a little bit about your personal background and story, um, if it's possible to do that briefly, that kind of led you to where you are today and who you are today. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I will try to be, uh, be succinct with my answers. Again, we get to <laughs> talk about really fun topics, uh, then, then no promises. But uh, I am from uh, North Charlotte, North Carolina. So Charlotte is the, the queen city uh, down in North Carolina. Uh, the largest city in, in that state. I uh, was born and raised there. Uh, so I'm a Southerner by upbringing, right? Um, was there until I graduated high school and went to North Carolina State University, which is in Raleigh, the capital city of North Carolina. Uh, I was raised uh, in a pretty large family. I uh, hope my, your stu many students can, can relate. I mean, there are, um, I have a blended family. So my parents were divorced and got remarried when I was really young. Uh, and a little bit, a little bit of Brady Bunch happened, and I don't know if that reference still holds for people, but you know, <laughs> he's got along three kids, yeah. And then my mom had three kids, and so we made this bit kind of unit. And then my my uh, dad remarried and had two other daughters, and so total, I have like eight siblings. It's like eight of us all together. Yeah. Um, but we were raised kind of in different places, but six of us were really, really a core that, that were raised together. And um, left uh, North Carolina. Oh, my parents, by the way, really blue collar, um, blue collar. Uh, working class family, uh, didn't have a lot of money growing up, but we never went without, you know, and I never knew, never knew the difference for me. Um, went to school again in Raleigh at NC State University. I was super involved in student government, jumped into everything, fraternity life, um, uh, clubs and activities, uh, was in school for engineering for two years before I, I got out of engineering. That's a longer story, we won't go into that. Uh, but, I, but I went into business, uh, business management after that. Uh, as soon as before I graduated, I realized I was a mentor of mine, Who's still in my life now said, uh, why don't you do what I do? Why don't you work in higher education? And I didn't realize that there was a degree or career track in that space, mm -hmm. uh, but I was immediately like jolted by it. And so I, I took a look at a couple of universities in the Kentucky area where my parents had just moved up to from North Carolina um, and went to University of Louisville uh, and was there for 10 years. Uh, uh, both as administrators, uh, I taught as well in college of education where you and I met and as well as other places. Um, and then left there, decided to go into the two year sector of higher education. So I think about the in industry of higher education has a lot of different sectors and mm -hmm. uh, the community college is one I was not super familiar with. I taught a little bit in one at Jefferson Community Technical College in the city. Um, but I said, um, I, I, I would like to do this. I saw a job that was really right up my wheelhouse. And I said, I, I think, I should do that. So I took a chance, moved uh, my uh, then wife and my little girl up to Chicago. We uh, lived in Chicago. Uh, I was there for three and a half years. We did get divorced uh, after you know a couple of years in Chicago. Uh, we're we're still good. That's part of part of life, right? And we're still amicable and, and really close. And 
Uh, my daughter lives in Chicago. I saw a vice president position available, which I knew I wanted to go into that space um, in Minnesota of all places. So Rochester, Minnesota, which is home of Mayo Clinic. Um, and so I moved to Rochester and spent three years there as a vice president before realizing I really needed to be closer to my daughter again. Uh, it, was a, it was taking a toll on me. Uh, and so I looked back for jobs here, found a job at Prairie State College. I did interview and look at a couple of four-year universities, but decided this is where I wanted to be in this sector. So uh, I took the job at Prairie State and been here now for about uh, 10, no, no, about 14, 15 months. So it's been, it's been a good journey. Wonderful, thank you. It's interesting too, you never thought of higher education until a mentor pointed that out to you. It was really like my last semester and he said, hey, you know, you want I didn't know that higher ed was a thing. Like I didn't know professionals were, I don't know what I thought, but I didn't know the professionals would go get a specialization, a master's degree in the area of higher ed administration or student personnel, as some of them called. And, and I said, that's, that's pretty awesome. And so you got to talk to folks, right? People listen to people, get people in your life that can actually, who care about you, who are going to, going to talk to you because you just don't know what you don't know, particularly when you're in that, that, that pre graduation, those four or five years in college before you go off into the next phase, you just don't know. So make yourself available and make sure people are in your life that you trust. Absolutely. I think that's a good idea. And I think sometimes for college students, it can be overwhelming. Um, you just want to have a plan and um, you just got to stay open because sometimes the, uh, the plan that unfolds for you is better than the one you created. And like you said, you don't know what you don't know. So yes. um, getting your degree is the foundational base, but get out there, talk to people, build connections. And then that's really how you can take off in di different directions. Sure. Um, it, I think it's a sweet spot between having a plan and not being locked in too much, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, this is coming from somebody who is, this is not how I always felt. This is again, you learn these things and hopefully can help people understand them later. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a, if you think about the Myers-Briggs, you may do that with some of your students, but I'm a, a ESTJ, so I'm very high order, very high structure. Uh, I make to-do lists just to check them off. Even after I've, I've done the work already, I just make the list to check it all off. I'm highly anal you know, when it comes to that. I'm very anxious and ambitious. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not speaking to somebody who just lets life happen. Uh, I do. I'm a planner. I'm a big planner, but I've learned um, to be, be open, right? Uh, particularly because there are lots of paths that you, your, your plan can break off from, right? And so I like to tell students working on their bachelor's, get the bachelor's, work on that. Folks are talking about, well, when I finish my doctorate and then move to the West Coast and finish your bachelor's, right? Right, what yeah. What you're doing now, you, you're talking about stuff that hadn't happened yet. Yeah. You, you, you're losing track of what you should be doing now. Mm -hmm. One step, one step, one step gets you to where you need to be. Um, so make a plan, but be flexible and understand that, that things change. Yeah. As we all know right now, right? Yeah, right now is especially, I think, tough for us planners. Yeah. <laughs> you have to plan in a whole new way. But yeah. it's funny you mentioned that because we have a Charger Leadership Institute program and we just um, had them take that test this week for their first session. So mm -hmm. um, when I post this, I'll provide a link to it. Um, if anyone has not done it, it's a good thing to know about yourself, what you are. Um, mm -hmm. It yeah. is the leaders, um, the best leaders that I've worked with and, and try to model myself after uh, are people who s tend to know themselves very well. And you can roll your eyes about these assessments and things. The reality is that it's not going to tell you everything about yourself. It, it shouldn't limit you like that. Um, but the reality is every bit of information we can take in on ourselves to process and do this regularly because the fact of the matter is we're different as we begin right. to grow and evolve. And so constantly obsess about knowing who you are uh, and leveraging that. That's what leaders, despite their style, uh, leaders who are a little bit more authoritative in their approach, some who are a little, uh, a little more egalitarian in their approach, the reality is the best ones are regardless, understand themselves. So they're le constantly leveraging things that, that can help support the people they're leading and the processes they're leading uh, versus trying to take a hammer and do uh, treat everything like a nail, right? You're gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in and lead this way all the time. That's, I think that's immature and, and show somebody who's not spent time understanding who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just continuous reflection 
and yes. continuation mm -hmm. improvement. We, we have limitless potential for growth, which is something that always inspires me. Um, I was reading your blog and I was reading um, a, a blog called Privilege and Perspective. And you stated it warrants repeating that traveling, even within your own community, is vital to developing a more caring and empathetic mindset. It allows you to appreciate what you have, how little you know, and how much good there is in the world. So first of all, yes, I love this. <laughs> um, we met because you're my professor on a Trinidad and Tobago service trip, which was an awesome experience. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I, um, I wanted to highlight it because I really believe in this myself. Mm -hmm. And I think right now, obviously traveling and the way that we're used to thinking about traveling is limited. But in here, you said traveling even within your own community. Um, so I just wanted to see if you could expand a little bit on that. And sure. if someone wanted to travel within their own community, how would they go about that? What is, where's somewhere they could start? Yeah. So uh, it's going to vary uh, for, from community to community. I spoke with a, a faith community maybe a, a week or so ago, uh, and they're located in Winona, Minnesota. So if you don't know Winona, it's the southeast corner of Minnesota, right up against Wisconsin. Um, as you can imagine, that community is, is very predominantly uh, homogenous when it comes to race. Um, so socioeconomic status, probably so as well. Uh, it's going to be, of course, it's going to vary a little bit. Speaking to somebody outside of New York, um, uh, it's, it's really, to me, quite easy uh, to find ways to interact and to be in spaces and communities that are different. So you ask, you know, how do you do that? I think first is you make a choice, right? You're gonna make a choice to say, uh, doing this is by definition uncomfortable, right? Um, and I don't mean uncomfortable, like painful. I just mean, it's kind of like, ugh, I don't know. I'm, I'm ignorant about things. And I'm asking myself to go into this particular community or to this particular event or this particular service uh, maybe it's a faith community service and you don't really know what to expect. We don't like that, right? Particularly, you know, people who are in college and exploring. A lot of us are, are, are like to, to know what we know, right? And be around something familiar with. So that first step is that, that I'm making a choice that I'm going to do this. Uh, if, that's, if that is study abroad, cool. If that is, I'm going to go and spend time in a particular uh, art uh, area within a community. I'm going to do that here in Chicago, as you can imagine, we have uh, entire neighborhoods uh, of faith neighborhoods. Uh, we have Boys Town, which is a, a neighborhood that is uh, highly populated and has businesses uh, supporting uh, and catered to LGBTQ plus population. Um, you can imagine a Humboldt Park, right, where there's a, a number of uh, Latinx communities, Latino, Latina communities. Uh, and ethnicities within the the South American Central American diaspora, right? Uh, there are there are museums and cultural artifacts and establishments, institutions that are there. We have a Swedish museum uh, in 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 the north side of the city, right? But I have to make a choice to do that. Like I have no reason to go into the Swedish museum, but to explore and to understand and connect to those those things. Um, and so I think it's incumbent on us to make a choice. We're going to do that, and then to narrow it down, right? Uh, you have an entire life to live, God willing. So uh, you should think to yourself, well, what do I want to look at? Well, you know, think about it as like, like a subject in class, like you're picking classes, right? Um, you don't have to study. You're not going to find everybody's experience captured in one place, right? You're not going to even understand a full Black experience by going to somewhere, say, like Harlem, right? Um, you're going to find Black experience there, certainly. Uh, but uh, my experience as a Southerner is not like it was uh, in, in, in Harlem. Certainly there are connections, right? Uh, so there's just so much. So it could feel overwhelming to think about to how to do it. So so choose, choose to go and then decide, right? Okay, what do I, what do I want to, to begin to study? It's, it's funny uh, how people are so vexed by kind of social constructs like racism or what is, what is privilege and what are these things? Um, we, we have the, the, the entirety of the, the world's knowledge, literally, like right here, like right in front of us. And yet we, 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 we don't 
seem to know how to find out information. You can do a lot of this from the comfort of your own home before you step out, right? That doesn't mean going and reading arbitrary articles on from news sites. It means looking at historical documents, visiting a library and looking at some information. That's what that's what leaders do. They they they're 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 thoughtful, right? And they think critically about the world and about the people in it. Um, and so when I say culture, I do mean that broadly. Uh, some of us are constantly exposed, right, to others that may be different from us. I think about myself growing up in the South in Charlotte. Um, it wasn't really hard to be around uh, a bunch of white folk, for instance, who loved country music, right? That was not something I had to work at. I mean, I, I experienced it going into school or walk sitting out in the parking lot. My lot made it my friends um, were, were in those spaces. Um, but it wasn't as so easy for me to interact with people who were um, who practiced Islam, for instance, right? Or Judaism. I don't. I can't. I can't name. I probably on one hand I couldn't name Jewish friends I had when I was a kid that I knew were Jewish. Right? That's startling to me. Uh, but living in Chicago, especially on the north side, oh, uh, full. Uh, full of Jewish communities, very strong connection to the faith. Um, and having been able to go to a friend's house and sit Seder and the, and the Passover Seder and to be a part of those kind of things, those were choices I made, right? I had a close friend who happened to be my vice president there and she invited me to her home and I was like, hey, of course, that would be awesome. Um, and so those kind of experiences, you have to make a choice that you want to do it um, and think about the ways in which you, the communities that you want to go into and, and, and be be thoughtful about it, right? Don't just jump into it. Because I think that's when you can find yourself in, in really strange spaces. But get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone. If you're constantly in the same places, get out of that. There are even virtual communities by which to do that. I have to say that because I know we're in pandemic right now. So there are virtual communities to do that, right? There are people like me who are willing to talk to you, right? Not, not in a, like you're prodding and, and, and expecting me like I'm a strange creature. I'm still human, right? We have a lot of shared experiences. But if you want to have some conversations about things in a safe space, uh, do that. But also know some spaces won't be as accommodating and it won't be as safe. I don't mean you're in danger, but it's not as comfortable as having one-on-one -on -one with somebody like me. But there are community resources that you can tap into as well, particularly when you are. Yeah, I think that awareness and the choice to, to delve into information, legitimate sources, good information that touches on and brings us to, to diversity, okay. which is something that you have quite an amazing background in. Um, and you go to different colleges and businesses, um, if I understand correctly, and you help them with their diversity. Mm -hmm. So I know that um, this is not a blanket thing that, you know, one size fits all. But in general, it, you know, could you give any go-to tactics that you might provide to, to a department or a college or a group of people that are wanting to enhance their diversity awareness and, and support? You're right. Uh, it's not a, it's not a one size fits all. Uh, it is, a, a, I think, a very narrowly tailored kind of experience uh, based on where you are, right? Uh, I think one thing, and I'll, I'll share this with, with you and, and your students for sure, uh, is to be really clear about language um, and, and and be bold in seeking out the goals that you want to achieve. So th those two things. So first with the language, um, we say diversity, we use diversity in therapy. Uh, we use it a lot. I think we, over, we over, overuse it, right? It's like communication. Be a better communicator. But that means that means a lot. That means a lot of things. Or be a better leader, leadership, right? These, these very nebulous uh, social constructs, right? So uh, I try to get people to really narrow in. So diversity being by the numbers, right? D people uh, who represent diverse backgrounds, which covers a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, it could be ethnicity, it could be veteran status, it could be your national origin, it could be the color of your hair, it could be the color of your teeth, right? Hopefully they're white or whitish. Um, there are lots of ways uh, to talk about diversity. And if, you, if you're sloppy with your language, then people get away from the real issues, right? So when we say diversity, let's talk about what we're talking about. Name it, right? I'm talking about the number of, uh, of people who are low income on our campus. You know, when I say I wanna increase diversity, what do you mean? You mean 
people who have no no lower income, people who are from a particular neighborhood in your your kind of service area. Do you mean international student? Like, what do you mean? So I try to tell people, what are the numbers? We talk about three terms, diversity, equity, and inclusion are kind of those, those words we use. Mm -hmm. uh, and diversity really is, I think, the easiest of those legs to achieve. People have been talking about that a long time. They just want to look around a room and see difference in diver literally the presence of difference. Well, we know that's not enough, right? It's not enough just to get people to, to, you know, to, the, uh, to the, the college or to the, the business, right? And so we talk about diversity being inviting someone um, to a party, right? Right, so we invite people to a party. We get a nice diverse group of people there. Inclusion is the next level where people actually are are asked to dance. You know, so they actually, you've been to a party or invited somewhere where you didn't feel really welcome. It's like, why am I here? Right, like I don't, I don't like, I don't know these people. No one's talking to me. No one's. Uh, I have nothing around here. Looks like anything I know or recognize. It's not. It it, it defeats the purpose of coming to the party. Right, um, so. Inclusion is really that, it's the, it's the spaces around you, it's how people feel, it's affect, right? How people feel, do they feel supported? Do they feel connected? Are they making friends? Are they, are they um, uh, enjoying the, the same things other people are enjoying uh, in, in, the, in the organization? And then I ask people to look at the kind of penultimate uh, aspect of this is the, is the equity piece, right? And equity is about outcomes. That's the thing that the United States in particular struggles with so much. Um, and our institutions struggle with. It's not getting folks there, it's not making sure that they're invited to dance, but it's actually making sure that they, they had a really good time and they leave the party knowing that it was uh, getting the same thing out of it that other people got, right? Uh, so this is where we talk about those gaps, achievement gaps, opportunity gaps, um, the pay wage gap in businesses, right? There's no point in getting a bunch of women to an organization and making sure that they feel good about being there, but they're not paid the same for doing the same work right? That's not equitable, right? Uh, so it doesn't matter that, they, and they might end up, the, the really perverse thing about this whole thing is that, and it, it's, it's perver perverse and it's insidious, right? Because it's, 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 it's kind of evil that you can have more women in the organization and yet they still experience different outcomes from the organization. They're not getting paid the same, they're not getting treated the same. Uh, that's that's a problem. And, and no, I think anybody, people of good conscience tend to know Okay, we don't want that, right? We want to see some kind of thing. Uh, and so uh, that's what I do with organizations and, and, and groups. We do specific things and deep dives, but I try to get everybody on that, that first, that's that understanding that there are, there are ways we define these things. And then we start talking about, okay, now what do we want to do, right? So now that you know that, as the Dominican, for instance, you know, now that we, we know diversity matters, we think diversity is important. So how do you know you're doing it right? Like, what does it mean to to be an organization that is equitable. See, that, I try to say not to say diverse. If you say diverse, well, by definition, that's why people get so put, turned off by this as well. It's because people, they don't feel like they're part of the conversation. It's like, if I'm a white guy, uh, white male identified as cisgender, heterosexual, Christian, you know, where, where am I in the diversity guy? Do I not matter? Do I not have diversity, right? Well, of course you do. You, you, have, you have things that, that you bring that are diverse as well. But we're not going to stop the conversation there. The reality is people who are like you are like 90% of the organization, right. right? So what we want to do is try to mix that up a little bit. And here's why, right? You can't just say we want to do it because it's the right thing to do. I think that's where, again, leaders get really tied up with this because we, we just say, what's the right thing to do? Well, there's a lot of right things to do in the world. But what does it mean to the, the bottom line? What does it mean for the organization? Uh, and it does mean something. So I try to get, once we start talking about those outcomes and goals, we try to get there. And that's a conversation I think our country in particular uh, has to, 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 to wrestle with, right? Uh, because there's a lot of fatigue around talking about diversity. Um, and and that's, that's, that's hard for people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that we have to have a slogan that Black Lives Matters. Uh, there's something wrong with that, right? We shouldn't have to say that, uh, but but people, large numbers of people feel compelled to say so, and people of all persuasions, right? People of all races and backgrounds, and good Lord, I saw marches in Australia for Black Lives Matter. I mean, these, they, they, so something's going on, and so we have to reconcile that and understand why why that has to be said. So, yeah, yeah, I think um, of using clear language. Um, 
it's mm-hmm. such an umbrella term. It's such a hot topic and you hear it thrown around a lot. And sometimes after the conversation, I'm more confused than I was when I went into it. And, um, you know, just really being aware of the language we're using and really pinpointing what we mean when we say diversity, yes. A, and then B, I love that metaphor. I feel like that makes things really clear, you know, not just inviting people to the party, making sure they're included, and then making sure they get everything out of the party that the people throwing it got out of the party. Yeah, and that's what we really want. And that's what I like the party example, too, because we all can kind of relate to that, right? Yeah. But I'm hosting the party. I don't want anybody leaving and saying, eh, it wasn't that great. You know, I you know, I didn't have fun. I danced a little bit, but I didn't get any of those little gift bags when I left. You know, that only certain people got those. Or the host didn't really talk to me, right? It was just talking to other people. So, again, we want this experience where we have, um, I don't know, we want, we want equitable outcomes for people. And I mm-hmm. think that, that's, that's the responsible thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that can be applied to a lot of situations, um, help you give direction. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you. Um, this next quote that I noticed is on your website, um, is John Maxwell Mm -hmm. and it is leaders become great, not because of their power, but because of their ability to empower others. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on why you chose this quote and what it means to you. Sure. So Uh, It's going to go right back to what I said earlier. First of all, big nod to John Maxwell. So uh, Dr. Maxwell is somebody I've I've followed for quite some time. I just, I I, I love his presence. I love his energy. Um, He is a person of faith. I'm a person of faith as well um, as a a Christian. Um, And he's just really, um, really smart when it comes to these things. He says things that's like, ah, it makes it clarifies. I think good leaders can help, help clarify things and concepts. And so for me, uh, that quote, I chose that quote, one, because of my, my fascination with John Maxwell, but also uh, because it speaks to what I said earlier about knowing yourself. Uh, leadership has been so, there's so many examples of really poor leaders in our world. Um, and there's so many examples of really great leaders. And it's all of the stuff in between. It's kind of hard to know well, what, what is it that leaders do. Mm-hmm. So fight the power that a person holds, right? Because power power can be fleeting, right? And I know uh, you may have in your, some of your grad work uh, studied the, the types of power, right? And um, I think there's power is one thing, but the, the thing that makes people stick is I think the influence on the people to whom you serve and lead, right? So it becomes about a synergy, right? It becomes, it becomes about synergy. It becomes about not what I can do and the power that I hold, but what I can get all of these 10, 15, 20, 30, 1,000 people doing, mm-hmm. right? And it has this, this multiplying effect of productivity and of uh, action and motivation when people are able to feel empowered to get things done, right? I want I want a team that does that. Um, and as I lead my teams, my key is to, I tell them often, I'm gonna try to stay out your way and try to remove barriers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, part of the, for me, the empowerment process is saying, what do you need to get this job done? Do you need, do you need my my voice? Again, my, my power, my, uh, my given power as a vice president to say, do this? Do you need me to, uh, release funds, right? Because I have power to release money, right? So but what am I doing with that power? If I just have the power to provide funds, but I, I don't give that those resources to people who need to do the job, then what am I really doing, right? What, what's, what's happening at that point? I still have the power. I don't need anybody to give me, tell me I have power. Power's mine by virtue of my position, right? The authority, the power. Now what? Well, now comes the empowerment piece, right? Which is, okay, how do I go to these people, give them what they need, uh, support them both mentally, psychologically, physically, financially, do what they need to do. And I think that's the essence of it, right? It's the why of leadership, not just what it is. Leaders mm-hmm. hold positions, yes. Sometimes leaders don't hold positions, but they're the kind of go-to person. Um, but it's really about the, the work they do to empower their, their followers. If you don't have people, you don't have good people, 
I don't know what you got. You mentioned that that's kind of the essence to you of the why of leadership. Mm -hmm. Do you think that also encompasses what leadership really means to you? Or do you think there's more on that? No, I think it does. I think it sums it up perfectly, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I, I, to me, um, leadership is, is, the, is the people business. And, and I'm, I'm thinking across sector, you know, the whole, the first fascination I have with leadership was re really through um, ROTC in high school. Um, so leadership was defined as the art of influencing others to get the job done. And so when I think about leadership, it is, it is the art uh, of, of influencing people, yes, but to a standard, right? And within standards. It's about giving people to do the right stuff and doing it in a way that's ethical. Uh, at least that's my definition, that's my, my, my life, right? Uh, people can disagree, but that's the beauty of living in a free society. Yeah, I agree with that. And um, one thing that Brene Brown says is it defines it as um, someone who has the ability to see the potential in others oh. and then pull that potential out, you know, and I think maybe better word than influencing that you learned um, back in high school would be inspiring, um, which I leads me to my next question. So I was reading through some testimonials on your website of some individuals who have used your services for, for help um, with leadership and diversity. I'm just gonna read a few really quickly. So the first one says, Michael has one of the most valuable personalities I know. He is, I, he is a dynamic gentleman that gets the job done and creates rewarding friendships along the way. That's one. He is an engaging professional and the students immediately connected with him. That's two. Dr. Anthony is a charismatic, inspiring leader who helps students, faculty, and staff realize their potential. So clearly you are an inspirational leader and you naturally build authentic connections with people. So is there any advice you could give for um, a, inspiring others, and B, just building genuine connections with people. <laughs> sure. Um, first of all, I, it's always, I try, you try to balance, you know, you know, I never thought, I wanted to be somebody who inspires and helps other people, uh, but it's always a little, when you're hearing it, it's kind of like, oh, well, I'm glad that they got that. I still don't quite know, I still wonder sometimes, you know, how, why, why did I do that? Or why, why, why did they get that expression for me? I'm glad they did. Uh, I'm gonna, and I'm, I'm gonna sound like a bit of a broken record here, so I don't, but I don't, I'm gonna try to change up a little bit. So I operate from a place of talents. So I, 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 when people say, oh, you were so good at giving that presentation. It's like, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And that was intentional, right? That was a reason because I do what I'm good at. Uh, so I don't go, uh, it's funny because we tell somebody like LeBron James, you are really good at basketball. It's like, well, yeah, that's my job. I practice. I, I've worked all my life trying to, to be better at this. And I put a lot of time and effort into it. And I play basketball, not baseball, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of us, well, we can see it really clearly in sports and maybe music. Um, I think a lot of us try to be really good at just everything and anything. And again, it goes back to some really, really naive thinking about who you are and about what your talents are. So I know some of my talents rest around communication, uh, winning others over, right? We talk about the strength language, right? Woo and uh, yeah. also about around um, helping people to kind of see complex issues in really kind of simple ways. And so I leverage that. I put myself in position to, to work with people so that they get the most out of it, right? I could be in front of a lot of different audiences or a lot of different people. I could work in a lot of different sectors, but the impact won't be the same. This is why you have some people who inspire folks who uh, who don't, don't do much talking, but it's through only what they do, right? Or it's through their particular craft that they do. So they may be a great musician. So they, they can't communicate you know, verbally, give a speech worth crap. They can't do it at all, but they still inspire people. People inspire people with music. They never even talk to the person they've been inspired. And I think the inspiration comes from people living in talent, right? So I think when you ask the question, 
well, how do I inspire people? You got to find out what you're really good at and then go after it, right? Yes. And, so, and that's sometimes around, I'm not talking about just as a job, right? I, I, I'm talking about in life in general, right? What are you, what are you really strong at doing? Uh, and then how do, you, how do you get better? How do you spend more time developing those talents? And then inspiration comes, right? When people are hearing you, working your talents, that's when, you're, that's when you get inspired. I continue to be inspired by people who are uh, super talented and they're different. I love seeing talent in action, right? The people who are good orators, yes. people who do well in, in, in particular aspects of life or certain industries. That is, people are inspired by, by success, but also by, by people who are, who are open and honest. You know, I, I'm, I'm one strategy I use is I'm very open in my setting the stage when I'm talking to people, right? Whether it's a classroom I'm leading or it's a large like orientation session or a large lecture hall, uh, I try to be very vulnerable in front of my audience because we all, it's funny, we just talked about the diversity thing. We all share things like grief and we share struggles and we share fear right? There are lots in our lives that we, we share. And I try to find that common ground very early because I recognize that people can hear you differently and listen and be inspired when they see you as somebody that, that gets it, right? They kind of get me, right? That's why I remind folks often uh, of my own upbringing, right? I, I mentioned my faith. So I'm a Black man from the South, right? Some people may see me and say, I don't know, I can't really connect to him, but I talk about my faith a little bit. And people who are also Christians are like, all right, okay, I think I, I, I know I'm Christian. I can, we have something in common. Yeah. Even people of faith, right. will listen and say, oh, I'm not Christian, but I get, I get faith. I get understanding that. Let me hear what this guy has to say. I talk about my parents, the, the way they came up working class, right. Tons of working class people out here in, in our country. That's, that's what blows my mind so much. We, we race is so problematic because we created race is socially constructed. That's not, a, that's, we know that, right? I mean, there's not biological difference between us. It's, it's the social construction that we then create uh, to divide us. But the reality is most of us along our income are living the same lives, right? Living a lot of the same lives. Then we have these intrusions because of our race. But um, so I try to build that kind of, you know, connection with people, be vulnerable. And I think people, people honor that. Right. No matter what your sector is, no matter what your major is or what you're going into, um, people reciprocate vulnerability. Uh, and so when you're when you're working with a group of people or talking with children or talking with your your, your clients, whatever it may be, uh, people look for common ground. And so I, I do that very quickly. And I think I've, I've learned to do that better as I continue to practice it. So. Yeah, you're not going to build um, an authentic relationship a relationship with someone else unless you are authentic about yourself. Correct. I have to be really comfortable with myself, right? If right. I'm not, people see through it. Like people can pick up phoniness, right? They'll pick up mm -hmm. like, he's spinning us a tail, right? He's just mm -hmm. talking to us about, he's trying to make a month, make some money. You know, he's trying to, uh, you know, look important. But mm -hmm. the minute they can kind of connect with you, they start to feel like, okay, uh, I, 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 might, I might have something I can get from this guy. And that's usually what my goal is. You know, I don't, I don't expect, I don't go in with this, the, the, the mission to inspire everybody. I go with the mission to, to cover what they asked me to cover, right? So if we're talking about leadership. I want to make sure people walk away with something that they can use, right? And utilize, and then try to sprinkle my own, my own experience and story into that, which then leads them into uh, sometimes it inspires folks. Sometimes people are like, oh, he was just all right. And that's okay. I never went in to inspire. I went in to just do some teaching and connect. And if I can do that, then good. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the true inspiration comes from people doing, you can just tell when someone is doing something that they are meant to do. Can't and you, you can just tell in their skin and their voice and just how they act and handle themselves that they are doing what they are meant to do. And that's one of the coolest things to see. And and I would keep going back to go back to your musicians and athletes, for example. I mean, right. that's the clearest example because it's just so easy to see. Right. Oh, it's nothing like seeing a musician, a pianist who is, mm -hmm. it just, it's just, or your favorite group, right? Like singing or, or playing a song. It's just nothing like it. It, it. it lifts your spirit. It does things that are uh, 
uh, are intangible to you, right? And I think all of us can do that in our own little spaces. It doesn't have to be music or the arts or athletics. It could be your own spaces, right? Absolutely. Finding your craft, which again emphasizes knowing yourself and your strengths. And something I like to talk about with our students is I read this recently that we always think of strengths as things we're good at, which of course that defines a strength. But if you're really trying to determine what your strengths are, it's something that you actually really enjoy doing. And after you do it, you feel energized. So there's some tasks that we do and we feel completely depleted after that's probably not one of your strengths. If you know something that when you do it, you lose track of time, you are completely engrossed in what you're doing. And afterwards you feel energized. That is how you know that's strength. Those are clues. Follow, yeah. follow the clues. If you, if you would literally feel like I'm ready once you finish, like I can literally feel the energy from this, right? I, I was, you know, every day is, a, I, I, once again, vulnerability, you know, every day is a struggle. The pandemic has taken its toll. Yes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there are hard things coming up at work that we have to make decisions on, but also I love my house. I really do. I love my neighborhood, but I am a huge extrovert. I mean, off the charts extrovert. Uh, and so I need to be around people. Yeah. I need, I need to think out loud around things. And so it's, it's just, plus I struggle with anxiety, right? I, I, I was medicated for anxiety many, many years ago. Um, manage my own, general anxiety disorder, right? So just times you just get, I'm always been very high, strong, and ambitious. That's, that's normal. But then you get abnormal when you start to do it too much and you can't turn it off. So um, yeah, this pandemic is wearing me out. Uh, and so this though, this conversation, I feel like I can uh, do anything now. I'm, I'm really literally recharged for the day because of the interactions we're having. Uh, but those are the clues, right? Look at the clues where you feel energy and you lose track of time and you, you um, others tell you you're really good at something, right? Don't mm -hmm. ignore it. We're really, we're, or we're too modest sometimes. Oh, no, 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 I didn't do. But no, no, no. Oh, listen, when somebody's telling you, you know, you, you put that together really well. You clean, you, you fix that, that solve that problem really well. You, you created this, you created this puzzle or figured out this system that's impressive. That's a, you're like, oh no, everybody does that. No, everybody doesn't do that. Uh, it's something about you, and you need to follow those clues and work on them. Yeah, I agree absolutely. And I'm happy to hear that. I'm feeling very energized too from our conversation. Um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and ask you because I think, especially as students, you have lots of up and downs, mm -hmm. and you have lots of um, of tough moments, especially now, as we're saying in the pandemic. Um, so can you think of a time in your life you experienced something that was a failure or a setback, um, and now looking back it actually helped lead to success for you? Yeah. Um, let, let me use something from, um, let me use something from college, and then I'm going to talk to a college audience here. So, uh, I was a very high achieving high school student, not very, I mean, I was all right, I mean, you know, I had like, I went a 4.0 student, but I had high threes and 3.8, 3.9. Um, all AP courses and all that kind of stuff. I was always naturally pretty good at uh, science and math. And so, of course, I was going to be an engineer. First in my college to go to, uh, first my family to go to college. I'm a first generation college student. Uh, I have brothers and things who have now earned their degrees and different things. But um, first generation refers to your parents, right? So you're, you're a generation above you. So, um, Kudos to all my first generation folks out there. Uh, so I, I went to, to college and uh, my first semester, so my first year, 367, I had a 367 uh, GPA. I was an electrical engineering major, matriculated directly in, right? Normally if you have to wait sometime, I was directly in. Uh, and I was on my way, you know, Michael was gonna get his engineering degree. Uh, and the only reason I was gonna be engineering because I was good at science and math, I knew they made money. That was literally my thought process, ridiculous. But that's what I had. So I went in and uh, my, my first semester of my sophomore year, I really started getting involved in stuff outside of school, outside of uh, class. So my fraternity and my, uh, I played my fraternity that, that semester, Alpha Phi Alpha, is, I'm an alpha, uh, founded actually at Cornell University in New York uh, in uh, 1906. And so um, I was uh, really involved with that, really involved with student government. So at that point I was appointed to the Senate and I was a 
committee chair and oh, I loved it. And I had this funny thing because I completely failed that semester. I, my GPA was a 0. 0.6, <laughs> a 0. 0.6 semester GPA. You have to really work for a 0. 0.6. I, I had D, I had F's in everything except for one D in physics. I was in physics. I was, you know, I still knocked out a D in it, I guess. Um, it was, it was awful. And I was, um, I was pretty low. I went home and one of my aunts, uh, my aunt's husband, so uncle technically, but you know, whatever. He, um, he said to me, he's a graduate of NC State, him and his wife and my aunt, both graduated from NC State in the late eighties. And uh, this was 1999 at this point. He said, um, well, you might as well just come on home. You know, just go, completely, uh, you, you tell a 19 year old that, like, I'm like, wow. I, 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 I felt like I let everybody down, the whole family. Uh, my mom, my, they were gracious. My mom, of course, would still love me through it. But um, people, I just felt like a big, gigantic failure. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? Right. So uh, I turned it around. I mean, obviously, you hear the story now. So I turned it around. Uh, I went back. I had to go to the counseling center to, to work with the counselor, uh, not for any mental health reasons, per se, but because they needed to be worked. I need to be accountable to somebody to say, what are you going to do not to do this again? Because I was on probation. I was just above probation. Because my GPA was so high my first semester, my first year, I was at a 2.092 or 042, just above probation. If I had a bad semester again, I could have been suspended or put on academic probation. And so it was a deciding point where I had to decide what I was going to do. And I started asking myself a lot of questions. You know, once again, you got to ask yourself, why? Like, why did I get here? So I'm not a bad student, but I hated class. I asked myself the question, everything I love to do, once again, following the clues. I didn't, I didn't know this at the time, but everything I love to do had nothing to do with engineering in any way, electrical engineering. Now, I didn't have good guidance to say, oh, maybe you should be in industrial engineering or, uh, or operational engineering where I could be a little bit more management focused and more to people processes. I didn't know any of that. So I said, let me go to business because business people are in, they do people, right? They work with people, but again, didn't think through it well, but I had to get out of engineering. But it was that failure that led me to that line of thought, right? And the realization that it's not just about earning the degree. I have to be really happy in the work that I'm doing mm -hmm. or, or it won't last, right? So people try to go be a medical doctor because medical doctors make a lot of money. Medical doctors who are good make a lot of money, right? You don't get to be a... And I know there are bad doctors, I know. But the people who are most successful are doing things that they're good at, right? They're not chasing the, the title or the position or the money. The money chases you when you do what you're good at. And so that's what I said. Because living comfortably was important to me, right? I didn't grow up very you know, wealthy or anything. So I wanted to live and not be worried about money, right? I knew that was a value important to me. Mm -hmm. uh, just say you don't care about money when you've always had money. Uh, but I, I didn't have money. And so it was important for me to have to be comfortable, not to be filthy rich, but to be, I can drive what I want to drive and I can do what I want to do and take care of my family comfortably. And so um, I was like, well, if I'm not an engineer, how do I do that? And so you start to realize that when you start operating in your talents, you'll be amazed at how things follow you. So that's why actually the consulting started. I think. Catherine, you and I may have talked about this before, but the notion of, you know, why do I start a consulting to do this? I, well, I work full time. I, I'm not a full time consultant. I make that very clear to people I work with. I'm an administrator. I like my salary. Mm -hmm. I like my health benefits. I like my insurance. I like consistency that having a job provides. So I don't want to be a full time. Yes. So what I did was to say, but I still love doing stuff like this. I love connecting with students and exposing myself to these different students and people and organizations and different industries that are different than what I understand. I love that. So how about I, I start this and, and develop more of my skills around communication, around connecting with people and all of the success follow that, right? I did that, worked in my strength and I started seeing the opening of like, wow, this is, I'm being, I'm getting, I'm getting clients. Like people want to work with me. I'm, this is actually working, right? It was in 2014 when I first was exposed to the kind of positive psychology strengths, the, the Clifton strengths find to work. Uh, but it's mm -hmm. bigger than just the five, top five. It's, it's the, the thinking. It's the thinking that, oh, 
I need to operate from a place of talent, not deficit. Stop being so worried about those deficits. I was so obsessed with being well round. I remember thinking this, like, I want to, okay, I got this. I want to be, I want to get these things now before I did strength things. I want to do, do these things because I'm really good at communication. I don't need to work on that anymore. I literally remember saying this to myself in my mid, early twenties. I, I don't need to keep working on that because I, I kind of got that down. All right. But then I learned, well, you know, you can get even better at that. You know that you can even get you can, the greatest area of growth is in your area of strength and talent, not in these yeah. deficiencies. Mm-hmm. So I, so it changed my world. It changed my world, and I started operating out of that. And it's been a, it's been a good journey. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think a lot of times it can be discouraging when you go down a path that you were so set on that you knew that you always were going to do, and it just doesn't work. I was a pre nursing major, and um, mm. they brought a real spinal cord to class, and I thought I was going to pass out. <laughs> and so I knew at that point I want to be in a clean office without any body parts. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, and I had to work so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I had to work so, so hard and study so hard to get like a, barely get a C. And, uh, you know, I, I think that learning what you don't want to do helps you figure out what you do want to do and um really just trying to build on your strengths rather than putting so much energy into like building on your weaknesses i mean we're able to build on our weaknesses for sure but but um but really putting the energy and like you said earlier you know we we always are trying to be everything i think and it's just unrealistic i think things like social media maybe can can uh, contribute to that. Um, And, you know, we only have so much to give. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like to say say manage your weaknesses, Catherine. I mean, I think that's what it is. You Mm -hmm. manage, you don't, you don't, you can't let them be so bad that it's going to hurt you. Um, But you don't have to spend all your time working on them either, right? Just get them to where they need to be, you know, to manage and then go work on your strengths. Yes. I like that. I like that language and way of looking at it. All right. Well, speaking of people trying to do it all and be it all, um, you're a dad. You have a big role at Prairie State College. You volunteer. You help organizations with leadership. Um, how do you juggle and prioritize? So prioritizing is first. Then you juggle. Well, so uh, family, that's a no-brainer right? First. Mm-hmm. Um, so I prioritize and I'm very clear about those priorities. My career is very important to me, right? So I prioritize that you know, after my family and friends they, that, that, that work. And I have a duty, right, in my job to, to be somebody who's, I'm, I'm paid by the taxpayers of District 515, I'm paid by the city and state um, to do this work. So I need to show up and I need to be present. And I need to be activated. So that's, you know, those things are clear to me, right? Mm-hmm. Then there are times where juggling has to happen. And so I tell people, um, I look at life in terms of, you know, Dr. Michael Suje, uh, the professors know, uh, said this a long time ago, stuck with me when I was one of his grad students, um, was he talked about, uh, uh, first of all, I believe in work-life harmony, not necessarily balance, because balance assumes that things have equal weight and they don't. Uh, so I try to let them kind of all merge together nicely. It's harmony as well. But he said, there will be times I look at your life, expand the, the time of uh, frame that you're looking at balance. If you're trying to balance day to day, that can get tricky, right? Because there are things that happen and take up your time for m- multiple periods of time. So I try to spread out my idea of kind of work-life harmony slash how do I balance priorities in a day? Mm-hmm. So for me, I kind of look at, you know, from the month, month to month. You know, sometimes year to year, I look at okay, how am I doing this year versus last year versus next year coming up. Um, so that that's something I, I try to think of, uh, and I and I don't uh, I don't take on too much. This is better for me now, right? I have more control now. So for instance, there was a time in my life where I knew that I was just going to be juggling things in a way that was not going to be very comfortable. Some balls were going to get dropped, some things were going to be tough. I was going to be stressed. You're in your senior year, working towards your thesis. You are applying to grad school. You're uh, in a relationship with a significant other. You have a sick parent. That's just going to be a hellish year, right? Mm-hmm. And you got you got to go. You got to embrace it. It's like getting ready for a storm. And being in the south, we know about hurricanes and such, right? You 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 got to. It's better to know 
then then get let it come up on you you didn't know you can prepare preparing for hurricane doesn't stop damage it's not going to stop inconvenience either but you're prepared to mitigate some of the damage right and you're better off because of that preparation you also learn for the next one right and so it's the same thing with your, your life right when you feel overwhelmed you have a lot of things going on First of all, you sh it shouldn't take you by surprise. You should have known I'm going to my senior year. I'm trying to take 19 hours. I have to take you. That wasn't a surprise. Don't be mad at me because you didn't think about your schedule before you did it. Like mm -hmm. you thought about those things. So be prepared is first. Um, and then hold on tight, right? Give yourself grace. Understand that there are things that's gonna some some balls will be dropped. Communicate, right? Those those challenges with other people. Your loved ones should know. Like I'm just under a lot of, I got a lot going on right now. Right. And so things are going to be, you know, up and down. So my family, when I was in 2009 ish, um, I was writing my dissertation. My daughter was on the way, uh, took the new job at the cultural center director. So I was building that center out. Uh, I was married. Right. We bought our first house. No, we were buying our second house at that point. Uh, it was just a lot. And I knew that it wasn't like somebody came up and said, here's a house. Like I knew these things were coming up. Yeah. And so I was prepared for it. And when I needed help, I went to the doctor, right? That's when I first had a conversation about anxiety because I wasn't managing it well. Mm -hmm. uh, but also my family knew what I was going through. So nobody, those things I care about, my family, they knew I wasn't ignoring them or trying not to be with them. I let them know. So I communicated. My partner was very helpful at the time. Um, and, uh, I, and, we, and, we, and we we got through it. But then next year, though, I, I didn't put myself in that position again, right? The problem, I think the breakdowns come when we put ourselves in that position over and over again, once again, because you're trying to be everything for everybody at all times. That's just not realistic. It's not mm -hmm. fair. fair to you or the people in your life. And so I, I say when it comes to juggling, I know your priorities first. But then the juggling piece is try not to take on too much. So right now, I, I don't. My job is my thing. I know I'm not great with this pandemic stuff. I'm not going out taking on a bunch of different duties. I'm not going out volunteering for a bunch of different stuff. I'm not pulling and starting a new writing project while I'm in the middle of it. I'm just not going to do it, right? Because it's too much. And so uh, I learned to say no. I learned to say no. The older, when I was, when I was in grad school, I, told my, I tell my grad students this. I may have told y'all this when y'all were grad students. Um, and I tell undergraduates, sometimes, nope, not undergraduates, grad students. I say, say yes a lot, right? So people are going to ask you for a little project. Okay, you do this. So say yes a lot push yourself a little bit, do that. But when I say you get past that, I say, say no a lot. Be okay with saying no, and not, not even because of some major emergency. Like I like to, I, I like to, I got a new Oculus Quest, the two, the, the new VR headset. And I want to play with that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take on this new class I got to teach at night, because so, my nights are mine. That's the nights of time where I can actually be uh, either with a friend or by myself in, immersed in some fantasy land because I got to get out of this, this current reality we're in. Um, so that, because that's my time, right? And so that's what you do to juggle. You, you expect it, you get through it, and then you try to find a way to, to bring some serenity to your life so it doesn't happen. Yeah, I really like what you said, work-life harmony um, rather than balance because and looking at it in a bigger picture, not on a daily basis, because especially working in higher ed, you know, I have times where you're just going to be working late all the time and you know it, but then you have times where it's going to calm down. Um, and for me, it helps me too. Even if I take a day off here or there, when I take those days off completely, I'm off. I'm not checking stuff. I'm not working. And I think that actually makes me more productive when I come back. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think saying no and learning what to say no to, which goes with knowing your priorities and knowing how to say no. It's a skill that I think we need to learn. I think it's very um, American culture to be like, oh yeah, I got this and this and this and I got, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that. And also to be able to say no in a, a polished professional way without, you're allowed to not give an explanation too. A person has a right to make a request and a decision can be made without apology, right? Mm -hmm. So people don't have to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I can't do that. And it's like, well, if you're sorry, that's fine, but don't say it as a buffer. We like the buffer. You nailed it. And in, in US culture, particularly, we, we, we want to, oh, 
No, well, but you know, I would do it, but I just can't. But that, but that, but that. I'm just, just say yes or no. I mean, it's okay to say no. Mm -hmm. um, it's something, it's something empowering about being able to say, I can't take that on right now, mm -hmm. or I don't want to take it on right now, and I don't have to apologize for it. I don't have to be sorry for it. And there you go. Absolutely. I think I'm just going to ask one more question. Okay. Um, and this one is, you know, if you could leave us. Well, particularly college students, um, you know, who are currently navigating their professional and educational journey, particularly during this difficult time, um, what advice would you give? Um, I think I think that's easy for me because I, I I'm pretty passionate about about this. What I'm about to say, um, your bachelor's years. Um, are really cool. Um, they're really cool. Uh, and, and I need you to realize that you don't get them back, right? I was sharing with uh, some graduate students earlier today from Western Illinois University uh, that you, you don't really get this back, whatever this is, right? You don't get another chance. I know we're recording me talking, but I don't get another chance to speak with you all, right? Even if, even if I did it multiple times, I don't have this time, right? Uh, when you're going through your, your undergraduate career, focus on two things. Focus on your talents, surprise, surprise, right? Focus on who you are and what your strategies are and focus on how to think better, right? Focus on how to think better. Um, the whole idea of taking the courses you're taking, particularly in the first two years, is really about helping you learn how to be a better, more critical thinker, to understand information, especially now. Um, the, the, I don't know if you, this is great, that, that great documentary is on uh, Netflix called uh, Social Dilemma. What's really horrible about finding about the social dilemma is not that social media is evil. It's that we're, we're problematic, right? It's us. We take everything at face value. We don't listen to anybody else. Um, we don't explore and examine things for ourselves. We're unwilling to change our own minds. Um, and, and, Social media exacerbates that, right? That's all, it's a tool that we continue to use in really dangerous ways. So, so learn who you are and learn how to think better. Notice I didn't say pick the right major. So for most, this is the big one here. For most things, oh, I try to say words like most, but for a large majority of you, a number of you, your bachelor's doesn't really matter compared to the career choice you'll trek into, particularly now particularly now. Getting it is like getting a membership card, right? And I kind of hate that higher education has gotten so monetized and it's so expensive. And so, but you're buying this membership card to, to play on a certain field, right? So it opens you, that's why I like higher education. It's at the associate's level, the career tech, no matter what it is, you're, every, every level gives you a, a new access pass, right? Then all the other stuff you do has to get you where you need to be in that in, on that field, right? Your practice and you're working with uh, your networks that you build up, all those things. But it doesn't matter if the card was given to you from your business school or from the English department or from this department, you just need that card, right? It's all those talents you bring outside of having that card that gets you moved into higher levels within that field and within that club, right? It doesn't, you're going to get in the club just from having a bachelor's degree, but everybody, a lot of people got bachelor's degrees. A lot of people have a card to get in that club. Right. Some of them earned it. Some of them got it because they know mom and dad took care of them. Some of them got it because they, you know, they cheated their way through, you know, a whole bunch of people got in these systems. Right. And so the bachelor's experience is about learning how to think and learning your skills. Save for a few things. So, for instance, if you're going to be an attorney, it doesn't matter if your degree is in literature or in poli sci, pre-law. I mean, that's fine, too, but yeah, it doesn't matter. Right. For our degree. So what Catherine and I have done. Um, the, the bachelor's, there's no prerequisite, right? So you're going, I, I pivoted to education, right? And so I didn't have to have the bachelor's in, in business management. I could have had it in engineering. I could have had it in lit literature. If I could go back, oh, I would study the arts, the classics, the things that I, I make fun of when I was a student because I was like, that's not a real degree. What you going to do with that? Because I was ignorant, right? I'm ignorant. I didn't know. What do I know? I ended up in college. How do I have an opinion about what your degree is going to do? So I, I just, I, I would have learned, I would have worked on things that's gonna make, make me better communicator. I love vocabulary and language, right? History, 
right? I would have learned how to be a really critical thinker in that space. I picked up more of that in my graduate program than I think I did in my undergraduate. So use this time to do those things. Don't stress about, am I a, a, a pre this or pre that or in English or versus humanities major? I mean, to some extent you wanna be in what you're enjoying, but your purpose, right? is to, to align your talents and what you, uh, what you need to do, learn how to be a better critical scholar and thinker, and then have, and do really well. Because again, when you're working your talents and when you're doing stuff that's gonna make you a better scholar, then you're gonna succeed, right? You're gonna get those A's and you're gonna get those experiences and internships. You'll get those experience travel where then you can pick your, your, your grad school, right? Or pick your job because you did so well as an undergraduate, but you did well as an undergraduate, but not because of the major, because you were doing something that you love to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's where you need to line up your priorities right now and not be sweating the, the, am I taking 14 hours or 16 hours and I gotta rush? What are you rushing to? I don't know what people are rushing to. But I'll tell you, ask Catherine, once you're done, work, you start to work. And I guess you live and you know, it's all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, now what? Like what, my, what Dr. Jackson asked me years and years ago, Dr. Tom Jackson at Louisville, he asked me the question, you know, what are you rushing for? When you get there, then what do you do, right? I rushed to be a vice president, I rushed to be a president. Uh, I, I turned 40 uh, this year, by the way. Yay. Uh, and so, if, thank you. If I, if I rush to get to where I'm going, <laughs> I still got another, I look now, y'all got another 25 some years, 25 before I can retire. Not to say what's gonna go on after that, you know, God will not last that long, but that's a long time. And so what, you are, what are you rushing for? Take your time, learn your trade, learn how to think, boost your talents, boost your skills, and then go out and, and start going through the career that you wanna go through. So that's what I would say to, to you all. I love that. And I couldn't agree more. And of course, there's always going to be specific majors where you have to major in that. But I mean, it's so true. Get your degree, meet people, learn, take different classes, get different types of internships and experience. Because in all the interviews I've been in, no one has asked me about a specific class. I've only been asked about my experience working. So exactly. I think that's where a lot of growth lies. Um, and, and yeah, don't rush it. I mean, we hear it all the time, live presently, almost so much that it's like oversaturated, but it's it's said a lot because it's true. And and college is a really unique time um, that you won't that you won't do again. Yeah, so. you heard the old adage, not all who wander are lost, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we, I'm not saying be aimless, right? People hear yeah. that and say, because remember, people say, I have to get through college. I have a family. I have to get money. And I'm, I know, I know, I get that, right? I'm not saying be aimless, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that if you push through and you land in a job or a career track that you really hate, what I caution you is that that won't be sustainable. It'll hurt your relationships. We spend so much time at work. We spend so much time at work. You'll find yourself miserable regretting the fact that I spent this money on a degree for something I hate doing, it will take a, a tremendous toll on you. Mm -hmm. Don't be so excited to think, well, I got to get done now because I got to get into this job and only to find that you didn't want to be in that job or that you're really bad at it because you're just not that good at it. You did it, but you're just not that great an engineer. You're not, you're just not that great of a lawyer. So you don't get the clients you need. Just, so you got to think about the whole picture. Don't, don't be so focused on, that first whatever or that next step, uh, focus on doing really great work now. And that goes for our working as well, but that's another that's another conversation. <laughs> and even if they get a job they hate, you know, you're still gonna learn transferable skills. So don't give up and don't ever have the expectation that your first job out of college is gonna be your dream job. Correct. It, it's a work in progress until you retire. You gotta keep yes. working on what you love, what you don't, what opportunity is next. And because you have the skills, because you have that bachelor's, you know yourself and you know your talents and you know how to think, you're an asset to so many different industries. So you can make, you can pivot. My parents always told me, my mom always said that the education is about options. You know, she, she was stuck in her work because she couldn't leave. She couldn't leave. She couldn't go else. Um, she didn't have the skills or the, the degree to do that. So I said, I'm getting my doctorate because I want to be able to always pivot. 
if I need to. If I don't want to stay in this space, I can always go somewhere else. So that's what you walk into, options. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Anthony. I have loved doing this interview today. I think our students are going to get a lot out of it. And I know you're really busy, so I really appreciate your time today. And I really enjoyed this. I was so happy to do it. And if you need anything else, you let me know. It was my pleasure.